Since the very beginning, Magic has used mana costs, color requirements in particular, as a way to balance cards. Look at these two cards from the original Magic set. They're the same color, the same rarity, and the same converted mana cost, but one's a 2-2 two -two and the other's a 2-3 meaning one straight up beats the other in combat. Even though their converted mana costs are the same, their mana costs are different. Now, if you're playing only red, and there's basically no difference between these two cards. You can cast them both on turn three, no problem. Now let's say you're playing red and black. You can't cast Hurlun Minotaur without two red sources. And thanks to the random nature of magic, sometimes you'll only draw one red source and the Minotaur is gonna get stranded in your hand. Magic's been around for a quarter of a century, but magic designers still use mana restrictions as a way to push the power level of individual cards. Goblin Jam Whirler is a good example of what happens when R&D leans a little too hard on the premise that mana restrictions are prohibitive when, in reality, they aren't. In case you've been living under a rock for the past six months or so, the best deck in standard has been a black-red aggressive deck that's mostly red, but has a small black splash that facilitates Scrap Heap Scrounger, Unlicensed Disintegration, and the ribbons half of Cut to Ribbons. Goblin Chain Whirler was never supposed to work in a two-color deck. Its whole design is contingent on the hope that playing it forces the deck builder to go one color and lose out on the options an additional color brings to the table. R&D messes this up a lot, particularly with sets that have a multicolor theme. Here's a really extreme example. This deck's almost 10 years old at this point, so most of you watching probably don't know what any of the cards do, but that's okay, because we're going to take a deeper look at the spells here real quick. Look at the mana cost here. This is... God, this is so bonkers. I can't believe magic used to be like this. We took out all the colored mana symbols from the main deck of this cruel control deck, and uh, yeah, this is absurd. A straight up five color deck that's based Grixis, but can support a card that has four green mana symbols in its casting cost. That shouldn't be possible, and that's not hyperbole. The problem with Lorwyn and Alara standard is that the cards were clearly designed with the assumption that colored mana symbols were a real restriction. This premise falls apart thanks to two things, Reflecting Pool and a cycle of uncommon lands from Lorwyn. One of the tenets Magic was built on is that the colors of the cards matter. You shouldn't be able to just put all the best cards in a pile and call it a day. Admittedly, the Vivid Cycle is pretty slow. They all entered the battlefield tapped after all, but between Plume Veil and Volcanic Fallout, the five color control deck had plenty of ways to stave off a <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Plume Veil and Volcanic Fallout, both intended to be cast on turn three in the same deck. Mana That Good probably wasn't intentional. I'm pretty sure the Vivid Land Reflecting Pool combo was intentional, given that they were in the same block, but slow combos like that are usually preyed upon by the aggressive decks. However, stuff like Plume Veil, Volcanic Fallout, Wall of Reverence, Terror, Remove Soul, etc., all ensure that aggro couldn't really do anything. The roadblocks were good by themselves, and the fact that the deck got to cast the best six and seven mana cards in the format to close out games, unencumbered by something as trivial as a mana cost, meant that nothing else really had a chance. The idea here is that mana's usually better than people think. Yeah, a monocolor deck is always an option, but empirical evidence suggests that you should be more willing to take on some risk. Not only are the risks rarely as steep as they seem, but the payoffs are usually worth it. Here's an example from Return to Ravnica's standard. Good old Bant Control, white, blue, green. Like Plume Veil before it, this deck had its own annoying roadblock to aggro decks. Thrag Tusk, which comboed with Restoration Angel to nauseating effect. Playing against those two cards was not fun, and to add to the unfun, the deck also played the full four Sphinx's Revelation because the thing Stroke of Genius needed was life gain. For a control deck, Reed's Bant Control list had a lot of win conditions thanks to the ever-present Slaughter games, but the most unintuitive win condition was Nephalia Drownyard, which falls outside of the Bant colors. So why would Reed give up consistency for a millstone? As Riley and I noted the other week, the mana base in Return to Ravnica Standard is very similar to the mana base we're about to see in Guilds of Ravnica Standard. But there's one big difference. RTR Standard had Farseek, meaning any shock land Return to Ravnica had to offer was just two mana away. This resulted in some messed up stuff, i.e. the deck had enough room in the mana base to support a copy of Nephalia Drownyard, which is a colorless land with an activated ability that requires black mana. The deck wasn't black, but it didn't matter. The splash wasn't free, no splash really is, but the risk was worth the payoff. Reed Duke top aided two standard GPs in a row with band control. If the deck actually gave up consistency to accommodate Nefalia Drownyard, Reed probably wouldn't have done so well at both tournaments. He probably wouldn't have even played the deck. This is going way back, but the 61 card monstrosity that won Worlds in 1997 was a five color deck that had 10 swamps in it. It's mostly black, but it's got some other stuff like Manowar and Utabi Orangutan. 
I don't know. This deck's a little dubious, I'm not gonna lie. Like, everything in here is a 2-2, and it has Earthquake, so yeah. But it won Worlds, so who am I to judge? I'm just an idiot in your computer, or phone, or tablet. The reason the deck worked at all is because of City of Brass, Gemstone Mine, and Undiscovered Paradise. The deck plays three of each instead of 4-4-1, four, four, ostensibly because he couldn't figure out which lands were the optimal choice. Whatever. The point is that the mana back then allowed for some wild stuff. Thawing Glaciers was a fixture in this standard format as well, but this deck plays five colors without giving up any speed. Uh, I guess it has speed? Man, this deck is baffling. It just looks like he mashed two draft decks together. Magic was wild. The point here is that fortune favors the bolt. If you think you can cast Niv-Mizzet per run, well then guess what? You probably can. Screw the math. If you can dream it, you can do it. But hey, maybe you feel differently about this, and that's what the comments are for. After you like and subscribe, be sure to lay out in painstaking detail your mana base philosophy, and keep in mind that, as always, sound logic is forbidden in comment sections. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.